I pray today might be a day of change for you, maybe a change in your heart, um, especially, you know, uh, for our moms. Um, the series we're in is actually kind of talking about being more of a warrior, being a soldier, and uh, sometimes we give those titles uh, to men, but it's crazy. When you study scripture and you go through the New Testament, uh, you know, the book of Acts, even though men and women do have different roles at, at different places and wherever you're at, you know, but, um, you know, when people were getting saved, it says both men and women were getting saved. When the church was being persecuted and um, they were hauling men and women to prison, I mean, they were paying a, a great price. Um, if anybody's ever read the Fox's Book of Martyrs, a book that takes place right past the 12 disciples, um, it shows some history of the first couple hundred years of Christianity, which was very bloody. It was not, you know, today Christianity, you come sit and drink a cup of coffee and hear a message. You know, people like that. Back when Christianity was tough, when there was a price to pay to say you were a Christian. You read Fox's Book of Martyrs, man, and there's mamas, man, that was tied to the stake. And they would uh, want to take their children. And they said, well, if you would just then denounce, man, deny Jesus Christ and we'll save your kids. And, man, some of these godly women would say, no way. Um, they would tie pregnant ladies to a stake and, um, in front of her husband and say, okay, it's time for you to recant, man. It's time for you to turn. And there's so many beautiful stories in that book. I've read that book like five times now um, because it moves me deeply. It moved me, moves me to realize Christianity um, was never supposed to be soft. We've kind of made it that way. And I think we've done some disservice to the church and to Christians um, you know, just in that, you know, you know, here recently, um, there was, um, an elite Viking warrior discovered this is Southeastern Sweden. They found out that this Viking warrior had been buried for about a thousand years. Um, and of course, you know, the Vikings have been kind of hit in the last five years. They're making shows about it and they just come out with another movie, the Northmen, um, on Vikings. And I love that era of time where they fight with swords. But you know, as they were, they found this, um, this warrior, this Viking, they just always assumed that it was a male. And then they started doing DNA, DNA testing on this, the bones, and they were very shocked to find out that this Viking warrior, buried in a grave with two sacrificial horses, swords, arrows, and a ton of weapons, was a woman. You know, they were shocked. And um, if you've seen the series on TV, uh, they did a History Channel, did a whole series on the Vikings. You'll find out there were whole Viking tribes of females that fought. And I'm not saying that to say that ladies, you know, because, you know, honestly, some of the things about you that are so attractive is that God made you a woman, you know, and those things are different, you know, than a man. And not that you need to have, you know, big shoulders or anything like that, but most women that do the job correctly, you'll say, my gosh, she has big shoulders. You know, I grew up in a home where, um, and I always, I always am careful how I say this because I'm always afraid my family might get a hold of this message. And, uh, but, but I am a truth teller, I gotta tell the truth. And I grew up in a home with a mom that was a warrior, man. I mean, my mom was tough. My grandfather was an alcoholic, so she grew up with um, a sister and three brothers who all were, they had a, 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 a really a terrible reputation in town. They were just known for being bad people. And actually my mother's sister, my, my, her brothers, my uncles were known for fighting. So much so that even as I grew up, and like my brother was three years older than me, he'd go out and get into a scuffle and get into fights, and he kind of took on that lifestyle real early. And when people found out that he was related to the Hodgin family, they literally, they'd be in the midst of war. It'd be in the midst of terror. Somebody would say, he's related to the Hodgins. And my brother said, they would leave me alone. That's what kind of reputation, um, you know, they kind of had. And the brothers were fighters. And so much so they've, you know, all done jail time and a little bit of prison time because of living that kind of lifestyle. But my mom always said, you know, she goes, Mike, I'll tell you the toughest one of the bunch was your your Aunt Peggy, you know, Peggy would whip her brother's tails all up until they became men. 
she said she was a fighter, man. And, uh, you know, and so my mom had this in her, but you know, there was a difference in my mother. And what happened with my mom is when she was 14 years old, she, um, she got pregnant and had my brother when she was 15. So she dropped out of school and uh, my mom ends up <clears throat> living in the government projects. And of course I came along when she, she had me when she was 18, but she moved in with like the in-laws. They were gonna take care of her. Then there was some fighting. And so she ended up hating my grandma and they didn't share words for over a year, silence for a year. And here my mom is with her first child trying to make it in the projects on her own. And let me tell you, here's the difference maker. I'll tell you the beauty in this story is there was a lady a couple doors down that said, hey, we do a Bible study on Thursday morning. Why don't you come? Just moms, bring your kid and we'll just all hang out. My mom said, okay. So my mom goes and sits around this table. And one of the things that moved my mom was they went around the table to read. And when it came to the Bible, my mom started reading and she just was bumbling. She said, uh, I, I couldn't read very well, especially like the Bible, you know, that kind of language, the way it was written in old English. So she felt very stupid. So she went home. My mom started reading the Bible. Just and mainly because if she ever went back there, she didn't want to look stupid again. It was a couple weeks later she went back and got to the end of the study and they said, you know, and my mom spoke about, to this ladies group about my grandma, how she hated her and all this stuff. And they started speaking to my mom about forgiveness. They gave her the gospel. The gospel is, you know, that everybody's born in sin. And the Bible clearly says that um God sent his son, Jesus Christ, come and took the sin of the world. He owned it. He was responsible for it. And he was crucified and buried. And three days later, came back to life. In Joyce, he can change your heart. My mom became a Christian that day. And uh, several days later, she went up to, um, to my grandma's house and knocked on the door and said, I'm here just to ask your forgiveness. My mom tasted it, man. And it changed her deeply. And by the way, it was just several months later, my grandmother met Jesus Christ. My grandmother was an orphan. She never knew her parents. She was a rough lady, worked in the tavern, the local tavern in town. And so what a changed life she is. And my girls have only known her as a godly lady. And so when they met my grandma, they're like, my gosh, this lady is incredible. She was an amazing um, woman. And, but she wasn't always that way, you know. And she was just like you and me, born in sin, a lot of problems in her life. So by the time I came along, my mother had me in church. And I had a father that didn't go to church. And, uh, you know, churches seemed, uh, you know, to, to, to be more uh, friendly towards women. Uh, and, and especially, I think, some churches that want you to bear your feelings or share your heart. A lot of guys weren't into that. It's probably coming more that way. And the problem is maybe it's gone a little bit too far. You know, because a lot of men are just way too soft. But uh, my mom, for years, got us. She, she literally drug us to church, man. She, when we got into trouble, she always pointed us to the Lord. I had a mother <clears throat> that would, uh, <clears throat> we, we were always getting into some sort of mischief, you know, trouble. And uh, my father never stood with this, you know, like going to court or dealing with the police officers or dealing with the teachers or um, you know, and the second time I went before the judge, you know, my dad never went with me. My mom stood there with me. As a matter of fact, it was in my um, high school, early high school years, I was for the second time in six months in front of the same judge, and it wasn't going to go very well for me. But something happened in those six months. I met Christ. I went to church camp and became a Christian. And so when I go in there, this judge started to let me have it. Called me by my first name, you know, that's not good. Michael, you know, and telling me that I'm going to jail, you know, I'll be in prison one day. Give me that whole, you know, the scare tactics, you know. And I was already scared, honestly. He was giving me the business, and my mom shut him down, man. She said, stop it. She goes, this is my son. And, and she actually said this. She goes, this is my good son. And, the, of course, the judge said, you're in trouble. You are in trouble. But what she was trying to convey was that she knew I had met Christ. And he was doing something inside of me. And, uh, and so, man, I remember walking out that day, man, with my mom. I was like, this lady has had a great impact on my life. I've seen my mother lead people to Christ. I've seen her pray in public. I've seen her do things that uh, I thought most men would do. We're talking about growing up in a family when everybody claims to be Christians and it's time to pray for Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas dinner. There wasn't a man in the room that would man up. And, and they claimed to be believers. They would never stand up and pray. Everybody would say, Joyce, 
And my mother would stand in front of all these men and say, let's pray. And she would pray. It moved me because it took a, within a, probably a couple year period there. I'm still in high school. Um, it was pretty moving at Thanksgiving when we all got around and stood there. Everybody said, Joyce. And Joyce said, Mikey, you pray. And she taught me. I stood up in front of I was a boy standing amongst men. And I said, let's go to the throne. And I prayed. That all came from my mom. So, um, you know, we've had some bad times in our home, too. You know, my mom struggles because my brother was always a little bit. He was always a wanderer. You know, we're still not exactly sure where he's at in eternity. But my mom loved him. Um, uh, and, you know, when you give your children enough of Jesus, enough of God's word, enough of right, you know, that uh, they know. And uh, it was my brother had developed some bad habits in his life. And he was going downhill very, very quickly. And Sunday morning, we show up at church. <clears throat> it was a huge church. And uh, we pull in a parking lot. Me and my mom, I get out. My dad never went. It was me and her walking up there. And uh, my brother pulls in the parking lot. And we knew he pulled in because it was like. <laughs> he pulled up. He jumped up. And, man, he is out of his mind, man. He is drunk. My mom's like. Bobby, what are you doing here? He says, Mom, I need this. I need this. I need to change. And she says, you can't come in like this. <laughs> it was so funny because then I'm standing there. I said, you ain't coming in like this. You're going to embarrass our whole family. You know? And my brother, he came in. His church was big, had a big balcony. My mom said, let's go to the back. You know, so we're clear up on the balcony. We're standing. And my brother, I mean, he's, he is wasted, man. But when they sung all those, and this is back when, that, when most churches just sang hymns. So we knew these old hymns. And since my brother was drunk, I don't know what, my brother cannot sing. And he would get drunk late at night and come home and go into his bedroom. And he would lay in his bed drunk and sing. And I'd have to go in there at 2 in the morning and say, hey, shut up, man. You know, we get into it, you know. Um, uh, so he decided that now that he's going to go to church, he's all in, man. He was singing louder than anybody in that room. He was busting them hymns out drunk. I look over, my mom's crying. She's embarrassed. But he knew. He knew those words and he was singing them. He knew where he needed to be. Later in life, my brother did go to church and get some help because he, uh, he ended up developing a drug habit that uh, seemed uh, he couldn't shake it. And by the way, who's moved? Who can shake it? Jesus can. There's one that's bigger and stronger, but my brother didn't possess the strength. Sometimes we do that. If you're an overly disciplined person, you don't need Jesus either. Just try it. Don't come to church or quit and read your Bible and see if your life changes. Some people's lives would remain the same. And that's a good sign that you are living a, what, what we would call, Paul would say, a fleshly. It's a carnal Christian life. It don't mean you have to do heroin. It just means you can be perfectly disciplined and not necessarily really need the Lord. So, anyways, I, uh, I love Mother's Day. I love my mom. <clears throat> my girls know I do. I speak very highly of her. Um, I act like her sometimes, which that always is embarrassing because the things I didn't like, I do. And uh, but one thing they always really like is my mom still slaps me. She's a rough lady. She uh, hits me um, when I say something silly or stupid. It don't matter who's around. My friends, she hit my friends. They were afraid of my mom. She had no problem smacking them right in the mouth, man. And she'd tell them straight up, she goes, your mother heard you talk that way, she'd slap you too. You know, that's just how she lived life. So I still go home and I'll say something, my mom will come and go, she smacks me in the back of the head all the time, you know. I'm just like, because I'm, I'm still her, uh, you know, I'm still her, her boy. So today's a hard day for her because of my brother. Um, but I hope on the other hand, it's a good day for her. Because uh, I preach today to please the Lord. I also preach today because I want my mom to be proud. I want my dad to be proud of, uh, of what I'm doing for a living. Um, you know, <clears throat> there's 133 million cards sold for Mother's Day. Four billion dollars on jewelry, two billion on flowers, two billion on food on this day. Um, men, uh, it's not the same. You go to prison and some companies have brought in Mother's Day cards and said, we'll give the cards and if you pay the postage to write your mom a Mother's Day cards, they say they always leave empty. Every box is emptied. Every card is gone. They do the same thing on Father's Day. They take over half the cards out because uh, they don't have them. You know, 
because a lot of these guys and girls that are in prison, of course, they you know, grew up in fatherless homes or a dad that didn't do so well. So this day is a huge day. Um, and I want, I want to encourage you as a mom. I wanted to bring healing to you that didn't have a great mom. For those of you that want to be good moms, man, take this stuff and eat it up so you can influence your children for the good. But let's leave this place today on a high. I hope some of you today that need to offer your mother some forgiveness. Because, you know, sometimes, man, when you get a mom, sometimes they're just doing the best they can. They don't know. And doing the best they can is still not good enough. And I hope you can recognize that today that, you know, even though your mom probably did some things wrong because of her humanness, that you would maybe offer a phone call and uh, tell your mother that you love her. You don't have to tell her that you don't want to be like her. You know, you can just tell her you love her. You love her for her work's sake and what she did do, you know. You know, everybody knows, um, if I go to the Bible, man, I can preach on family all day long. And we'll just see that, man, that's how God started this thing. Adam and Eve, man, they put a family in a garden. So don't, don't forget that. But even people that are not believers, I mean, even like the great philosophers, Plato himself said this. The saga of a nation is the saga of its families written large. It's true. When you look at issues um, today, uh, you go to, uh, you go to like um, um, Ray's in town where, you know, like alternative school or people getting their, you know, GEDs, you know, uh, adults. Um, you look at that group of people and you start talking to them about their, their families and you'll find out, hmm, that's where it's broken. That's where it went wrong. It's true. And my daughter also teaches preschool and she would say that there's a lot of situations that they were involved and you're like, oh, this poor child. And then you meet, meet a mom or you meet a dad and you're like, wow. It's tough, man, because, you know, some of those things, some of our problems in life, I know a lot of it is the choices we make. You get tried as an adult all by yourself, but let's just face it. A lot of kids don't get, cho you, you don't choose to be born into this family with this mom, with this dad in this place, but there you are. And so what's beautiful is I love to watch stories of where God intersects with those type of people. I don't know if, how familiar you are with the Bible. Most of us in this room have been in it for quite a few years. We can't deny something. God is infatuated with brokenness. Yeah. Yeah. He loves broken people. People that will be honest and can bring their flaws and failures to him. And God says, I can work with that. There's one type of person, the Bible says, that God cannot save. It's a proud person. It's a person that can't be honest. It's a person that will never humble themselves and come to him. So uh, moms, um, I pray today. In all humility, you would come to the Lord. Know that he loves you and he'll take all the fragments and pieces. And that's what a mosaic is. You know, most people don't realize that. You know, you see a beautiful piece of mosaic. A lot of times it's brokenness. It's broken pottery or the best pieces are sometimes they take broken glass and put them together. And then put it up and when the light hits it, you're like, that's art. No, that's brokenness in the hands of the creator. That, that's broken pieces in the hands of of an artist. So today, take your brokenness and let's lay it before the Creator. Man. Flaws and all. We all got stories, man. We all got pieces in our history. You're like, that's not good. Whoa, that's a little rough. Yep, give it to Him. Lay it down at His feet. And don't, let's not be parents that do our kids a disservice by making everything perfect for them. That's a, a lot of parents think we, it's our job. Let's take away the suffering, let's take away the struggle. Bad plan that never works. Because let's face it, all of us that met Jesus in this room, did we not come to him in the struggle? You come to him in the brokenness, in the pieces. As a parent, to reach a spot where you say, God, I can't fix this child. But I know you can. And God, I'm giving them to you. Yes, do the best you can as parents. But at the end of the day, they need the Lord. They need a Savior. There's a spot in all of us, the Bible says, that we're born. We're born in sin, which means there's a cavity deep inside of us that is completely empty. That's where brokenness stems from. That's where all of our success tries to fill that spot. From jobs to honor to credibility to money to you can go sex, drugs, and rock and roll. If you look at the song 
Um, if you look at Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes, he lists every way under the sun that you can fill that inner, inner part. And he ends with saying it can't be done. That's a spiritual void inside where we, we need Jesus Christ. Hey, ladies, I want to preach to you today on the life of a lady named Lydia. I've never done this before, even though she's a very popular character in the book of Acts. But before I do, I want to share with you something that I've never seen before until my reading this week. And I hope it blesses your heart. So you ready for it? Go to Exodus chapter 38. In Exodus chapter 38, it says in verse 8, And he made the labor of brass and the foot of it of brass, of the looking glasses of the women assembling, which assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. That's simple. That's short. I'm like, what are these ladies doing? So here we are at the temple. They're making all these pieces and parts. And it says as they're, uh, you know, making these things, the, the looking glasses of the women assembled, they were using these pieces to assemble and make some of these things. Well, here's what's interesting. Um, there's a group of women here, and they are assembled right at a place where God meets with people. It says there's a group of women assembling. So I went on a journey to say, who are these women? And what's crazy is you don't find much on these ladies in the Bible. You just don't find them. Now, you'll find some different people in the Bible. Even, you know, John the Baptist, you know, you'll find out like Hannah. You'll see her at the temple there. Um, you'll, see, you, you'll see pieces and parts of like women going to the temple. But here it says women assembled and they're assembled. Uh, assembled Right outside this meeting place of God, right outside of the place where, you know, um, tabernacle and then temple, there's a group of women assembled. So I thought, okay, I can't find many scriptures on these ladies. So I decided to like, well, let me go to a lexicon, which is means that I don't know Greek and Hebrew. So they break it up into numbers and I know numbers. So I looked up the numbers to what women assembled. That's one word in Hebrew. And you know what word came, came up? The definition means to go forth. It means to wage war. The majority of times it's used in the Bible, which is only two handfuls of times. In Numbers 31, 7, it talks about warring. In Isaiah 31, 4, it says the Lord will come down to fight. That word fight is the same word given to these women assembled. I was like, wow. So in my mind, I'm thinking there's a group of warriors here, like, and they're females, you know? I'm thinking of that Viking they just recently found, that female Viking. Um, and I'm not sure it, it's like that. Um, I'm not sure because usually numbered people in the Bible to go to war were always males. And I'm not saying that women can't fight. Um, I wouldn't say that at all because my wife whips my tail sometimes. But now I do know there was groups of women and they'll meet sometimes at the temple and you'll see some spots in scripture where these ladies would serve. They would do what needs done. Some people even would say what you read on. I've read so many different things on these things because people are speculating. Look at things in history. I can't find much in scripture on them. But these ladies would sometimes even do the organizing and a lot of the cleaning, the type of things that would need to be in a course. And, oh, there we go. You know, here we go again. No, I'm just telling you what I'm finding in God's word. Now, do you guys remember when I preached the book of 1 Samuel several years back? Do you remember Eli had some sons and they would be at the gate? And do you remember it says that these sons, they should have never been priests because they were dirt balls. And it said all they would do was steal the good offering and good pieces of meat like at the offering to take home. Because, you know, these guys didn't get paid. You know, the Levites, would people would bring tithes and offerings, and they would live off of that. So when people would come in, they would take the best pieces of meat from the sacrifice. And it also said that they would take advantage of the ladies that would assemble outside. Um, these are the same ladies, which one part you see these women assembling, using what they have. 
And whether it's a looking glass, because you can think of looking glass two different ways. Looking glass can give you vision. Or a looking glass can, can be called a mirror. The only problem is this is the only time it appears in Scripture. And so it's really hard to define what it could be um, or what it is. But regardless, these ladies gave what was in their hands to see that the, the artifacts and the instruments of, of, of the tabernacle and of the temple were being built. They, they were using what they had. So they were here obviously serving and, and giving what they had. And we also see a passage of scripture where there's some ladies that will not sacrifice and give what they have. But they're there for their own desires. They're trying to fulfill their own needs where Eli's sons would, uh, would take advantage. But now these are grown women and they would willingly give of themselves. So you can see a group of like spiritual ladies and you can see a group of not so spiritual ladies doing what they want. I think most everybody could fall into one of those two categories. I guess I would like to say this, ladies. What I want to do is I would like to take the position of motherhood. I would like to take the position of a wife. And instead of like, you know, I'm not going to stand up here and just try to convince everybody. Just like, you know, you're a warrior for Christ, you know. <laughs> no. It clearly says, I think you can back up that these ladies were serving. A lot of verses on serving go to women. If you go to 1 Timothy chapter 5, and it talks about widows, it'll say, you know what I say, you younger ladies, marry. And it says, have your children. And it uses this phrase, guide the house. Guide the house. You would become like... The, the third member of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, sometimes not always seen, but is so active in getting things done. You were the guide. And if you look up that phrase, guide of the house, you know what it means? Leader. Sometimes they use the word ruler for that. And so what I would like to do, and I think this is what I'm learning from these women assembling here. I think they were there to serve um, God at any capacity that they could. But in their serving, that's what they contributed. That's how they warred. So what I would like to do, Jesus even says this. Hey, who's the chiefest of you all? Who's the greatest leader of you all? And it's like, oh, uh, it's the one that serves. That's what he said. Jesus calls leadership. The greatest among you will be the servant. And yet somebody that would turn down that role and say, uh, you know, I will not do that. Why does everybody say it? And then they, they immediately refer to, they go clear to the other extreme. Why do women have to be doormats? Nobody said that. I would, but I will say this much. If you get into the New Testament and read everything that a woman does and even inside of her home and her responsibilities, what I would like to do, though, is I would like to take servanthood, motherhood, and I think the Bible elevates it. And that's what we need to do. It's not my job today to lift up women and tell you you're incredible. But I would go to God's word all day long and say, you know, and some of your kids and the things that are being done, you know why that's happening? Because there's some godly lady that's doing some guiding there. Somebody's doing some leading. And somebody, because you know what? Hey, listen to this one. Mama, your children will value what you value. And if you want to value things that are not of the most importance, then uh, you're going to see that in your children. They won't give a rat's behind about God and his word and about kingdom issues and things that are bigger. They won't give a rat's behind about the problems around them and the world we live in because they'll be consumed with themselves. And then as parents, sometimes you've got to look in the perfect law of liberty and the looking glass of God's word and say, I've modeled this for them. I've cared so much what other people have thought. That now my children do the same. Wow. Wow. It's a hard job. So hey mamas. Just these women assembling. I think they were warriors. That's what the Bible says. I think they fought a fight. But a lot of the fight we fight. Let me tell you what. You get a lot done in the serving. And if you want to be great. And I think there's nothing wrong with being great. Then you got to take on that role. Of serving, and the Bible says your husband. And, 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 and hey, if it was Father's Day, I, I could preach the same message to dads. Use passages of Scripture where it says, "Hey, you want to be a leader, then you serve your family." You know, I, I would preach all those things to dads too. But 
on our calendar it says Mother's Day. So I just want to encourage you in your role as a mom, I just want to encourage you to war for and, and with your kids, but war with them. And one way you're going to do that is these ladies would assemble at the gate and they would serve. May your children see you serve an eternal cause. May they see you serving, even if your husband is a wiener. If he's a wiener, not a, not a winner, a wiener. Your husband's nothing but a hot dog, which you know what that is, right? It's buttholes and eyeballs ground up and they shove them in tubes. Or we call it tube steak growing up. And have steak tonight, tube steak. Boiling hot dogs on the stove, man. That was, that was a meal, right? And so if your husband is nothing but a wiener, and you serve him, you'll love him, your kids will sit back and watch that. Why? And you know why? And you got the New Testament verses to back it up. Yes, yeah, sometimes he is hard to love. But I love him through the Lord. Because I love the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength, I love the Lord. Therefore, I'm able to love. And up to your kids are not ignorant. Your kids are not stupid. As they grow, they'll pick up on this and say, and eventually they'll say, and that is Jesus. My mother always modeled Jesus. In 1 Timothy 5, uh, Mom, as you guide your homes, remember that. You know, the Holy Spirit uses God's word and he guides us, right? So like the Holy Spirit, ladies, use God's word and guide your children in their decision making. Now listen, as our kids get older, they make, they make decisions for themselves. So we guide them when they're smaller. When we get older, you know what you do? Like the Holy Spirit of God, you use the word of God and you share it with them the scripture as they're going to make decisions. And we say things to our, our, our children like, man, what do you think the Lord would want here? How do, and we have these conversations. And so you model for them a life of every step and every decision you make because you're seeking God and his word because you want to please him. If you value that, mom, geez, it's going to rub off. And I'll tell you, I could tell you stories about my mom, you know, that, you know, we could have had her put in jail. And there's no doubt about it. And I look back now and you know what? And it's like my, me and my brother just sit down and talk uh, before he passed away. And it was just like, man, all that stuff we did, we drove her crazy. Crazy. We about destroyed her life, man. We, we, we just like lived to cause trouble. And to, it was terrible. And God got a hold of my heart. And I'm so thankful for that. But I'm thinking of the things she did. And you know what? I look today and I'm like, man, I didn't hold that against her. And it's not that I just want to be dysfunctional and pretend my mom was perfect. You know what my mom did? She lived a life and she modeled a life and then she guided me accordingly. And she would, and then make me pay the price. You know, I'm going to school. I'm like, I ain't going to school. I hate school. I ain't going. You know what my mom said? Get your, you know, she would do all that. But then eventually I got too big and old enough and she's like, fine. Then don't go. That was nice. And so I didn't go. And you'd get you know, either a letter sent home or I remember going to school and, you know, Mike Blake, please come to the office. I'd go to the office. Like, yeah, what's up? You know, I sit down. Oh, you're going to repeat this uh, grade again. You've missed too much school. What? Yeah, you're only allowed to miss this many days in the semester. And I'm like, oh. And school was not hard for me. Like, it was easy. I just didn't care. And so I started going to school. Well, once I learned that rule, you know what I'd do? Every time you'd get, you know, the semester would turn over, I'd be like, okay, then I wouldn't go to school for the next week. Then I'd show up because if I missed any more. I would have to repeat the grade again, you know. You know what my mom did? She taught me. If you choose to sin, you choose to suffer. And guys, this is coming from a guy that a mother who never graduated high school. So, like, I'm in junior high school sitting down with my mom. She's like, get in here. You need to help me with my math. I can't figure this out. And she got her GED because she couldn't get a job. And so I would sit there. I became a school teacher. I'm sitting in the seventh grade working on my mom through these problems, you know. So I knew better. And so now, now that I'm a little bit older, she's just like, well, then don't go to school. Have at it, pal. You know, and then like, wow. She, you know, she let sin bite me. She let it bite me. And she let, even when I got in trouble, there were times, like, she did not run to my defense. Of course, the rule in our house was, I, they don't spank anymore in school, but back when they did, it was like, you get whipped at school, 
You get it twice as hard when you get old, man. So you did everything to hide that you got whipped at school. Usually they try to send papers home, but you didn't have to hand those papers to your parents, which I never did, you know. They actually stopped spanking in our school in the ninth grade. So in eighth grade that year, I got eight whippings, man. I just thought, man, by the time I was senior, that hurts, man. That hurts. It hurts your pride going out there getting a whipping. Some grown man just bending you over and letting you have it, you know. You go in, the whole class is going, ooh. Oh, shut up. Oh, you guys shut up. Take your Bibles and go to Acts chapter 16. I want to get after it now. Acts chapter 16. <coughs> There's a lady in Acts 16. She doesn't appear um, in the Bible except here. Um, but she was obviously very influential. In Acts chapter 16, I'm going to run through this story. I hope it's a huge blessing to you. Um, it says in Acts chapter 16, um, this is the chapter where Paul sees the vision for Macedonia. That guy saying, come and help us. And Paul ends up saying, man, I'm going to go help these guys. And this is on the way we find, like he hits churches. And uh, like we're studying Thessalonica right now in the Bible Institute. This is where, man, Paul, all this starts here, right? So he's in verse 12 and it says, look at verse 12. From thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia and a colony. And we were in that day abiding certain days. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city by a riverside. Now, right away, this would be unusual. Paul is a church planter. And so what Paul does is he goes into cities. And the first place he goes is, is to the temple or a synagogue. Because, see, he was a Pharisee. He had some real credentials. He could stand up and speak because he had doctor behind his name. So he would go to that first city. It'd be a Sabbath day. He'd go right to the synagogue and they'd say, has anybody got a word? And he would say, I got a word. He would stand up and everybody would give him attention. He comes here and he's like, and he's not going fishing. But he says, let's go down to the river. Let me tell you why. There was no synagogue here. Or he would have went there. That was, it says in chapter 17, that was his manner and how he did things. <coughs> so it says on the Sabbath day, we went out of the, river, out of the city by a riverside. Where prayer is wont to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. So Paul had heard there's a group of ladies that prays down by the river. So normally he could go into a synagogue and take advantage of that situation. Now he's like, and they're like, uh, no synagogue, but there's some ladies that like pray down by the river. And you know, he's like, okay, we're going to the river. And so that's what he did. And in verse 14, it says, and a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of by Paul. So Paul <laughs> goes down there, him and his boys, and they sit down. There's a group of ladies by the river. Now listen, at this point in the story, I want you to know something. This lady, Lydia, she is not a Christian, but she's obviously spiritual, like she's some sort of religious because they're gathering down here to pray. Um, let me just ask you some simple questions. Because I think these can apply wherever you're at, at in your life. But Paul obviously hears there's a group of ladies praying down by the river. People knew that. Um, when you see the group of women assembled in Exodus 38. You see some of them doing godly works. And then you see over here in Samuel they're not doing godly works. So here's a question for you. Ladies, this is for you. Um, who do you hang with? They, they say if you, you show somebody like, the, if you see their friends, you see their future. Who are you hanging with? Obviously, we're going to learn this was a business lady. Before she even knew Christ, she was gravitated. She was actually a very successful, everything I've read about Lydia seems to be she was a successful business owner. And she still took the time on the Sabbath day to go down with a group of ladies and pray, to be spiritual. Are your friends spiritual? Do you hang around a group of women that are spiritual? Or do you hang around a group of people that we would call them fleshly? They don't mind the things of the Bible. Because let me tell you what, it is going to have an impact on your life. Now, you that are spiritual want to impact people that are not, for sure. But there's a group of ladies down here, and I think it's pretty sweet. That they're hanging. You know how it is. You know, if you have somebody that's spiritual, your husband's a jerk, 
and you want to go and rip your husband up, you know, a good woman's going to help get you back on the rails, you know, or you can be down at the river, you know, with the wrong group of women sharing the same story. And they're going to tell you that he's a knucklehead. They're going to tell you, I wouldn't put up with that. I, there's a difference there. Based upon your friends, there's a future. And uh, so what kind of people do you hang with? It says in verse 14 that there was a certain woman named um, Lydia. Let me give you Lydia's name. Her name means travail. Travail. The word travail would be like, uh, you know, a woman in travail. Um, like you think of this word in scripture with a lady in labor getting ready to deliver a child. Does the pain get any worse? That's what the word means. Her, her, her name means pain. So Lydia, we see all kinds of good things about her in the Bible in this chapter, but her name means pain. So would you mark this down? I think Lydia was a person of pain. You know, pain's no respecter, man. Travail and difficulty. I don't care if you live in the projects. I don't care if you live in Lincoln Homes. I don't care if you live in a trailer court. Or I don't care if you live in a 5,000 square foot house. Pain will knock on your door. Doesn't it? It don't discriminate, man. Hard times and difficulty. Some of the best of people. You would think, oh my gosh, that couple's not going to make it. Then there's the couple in town that you're like, now wait a minute. This was like the ideal couple. We idolize these people. Divorced? Them? Yep, them. Her name means travail. I think Lydia was a person of pain. So this morning, I'm going to ask you, who do you hang with? Now I'd ask you this. What's your pain? What's the pain of your past? All lives come with some sort of pain. And it's relative. You know, some people are like, oh, that ain't nothing. You ought to see what I went through. And it's relative. It depends. On, on your situation and who you are. But she had some pain in her life. And what I love about this is, guys, this is where Jesus does his best work. Can you ever have peace if you've never experienced pain? That's why we got to be careful. You don't want to create a church culture where all of a sudden every year we have this big VBS and all of our kids come up and all of our kids are praying these salvation prayers. Of like meeting Jesus Christ, the comfort and the peace of the world that will take your sin to somebody who's never had pain. Don't give that false impression like Christianity is painless. Christianity is painless. Have you read the story of the crucifixion of Christ? I don't think so. Don't buy that. That's, that's the wrong narrative. Pain is life, man. That's it. All life comes with it. The beautiful part about it is that we have a God in Hebrews 4, 15 that says he's a high priest. He is touched with the feelings of your infirmities. He's touched with that. So we're people that's all about the facts. But God knows how frail we are. Read the book of Psalms over and over again. The weakness of men, the weakness of women. And all of a sudden Hebrews, he says, I'm touched with the feelings of your infirmities. Our God is touched where your infirmities exist. He cares. Where you have moments of pain, that's where he can enter in with his peace. That's why if you read scripture, like the best of the stories are just like, yeah, and that guy was a dirt ball and he met Jesus, you know. Oh, they, yeah, oh, they go to the, Jesus goes to the well and who does he meet? Well, yeah, there's a lady there. She's been married multiple times. She's a whorish lady, the woman at the well. Jesus changes her life. See, he meets her right at that point of conflict or that point of pain in her life. So the story of Lydia, here's a lady. Her name means travail. Most people are like, oh my gosh, she was a seller of purple. This, she, she was a merchant, man. Uh, you don't hear nothing about her husband, so there's a lot of things written about it. We think she might have been widowed, but she did have kids because it says that here in a second. So we think she might have taken this business and even went to this place because she's from Thyatira. She might have moved the business over because she's making, I don't know. I really don't know, nor does the Bible say all that. All I know this is pain. Pain. When you choose to sin, man, you choose to suffer. Sin always brings suffering. Always. And so this lady had some sort of pain in her life. And, you know, as Christians, here's the difference between a Christian and somebody that's not. We have pain and hurts in our life. Do you remember Jesus? 
He went to the cross. They said, we're going to kill you. You're going to be crucified. This is going to be ugly. And the Bible says, and he was able to endure the cross because of the joy set before him. He could get past temporary pain for a greater joy. That joys you. That joys me. To reconcile people back to God. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. And ladies, you know, those of you that have given birth, why, why would you go through that? You know, you know, in China, they had to stop people from having kids. We're only going to let you have one, you know. And they would never have to do that in the U.S. if men would birth children. Because most of us would logically say, I am not doing that. That's ridiculous. Um, but you know, you know it's going to be painful. It's beautiful, but it's a beautiful disaster is what it is. And you know it's going to, yeah, your life will never be the same again. You'll go through that pain because there's a joy. Because in nine months, you, God, is going to use the womb of your life to produce a new life. It's beautiful. And so Christians, we have a joy set before us, right? And so that's how we can endure pain. What about other people? How do you endure pain? Well, we know how people endure pain, right? And some of you, before you met Christ, how did you endure the difficulty in your life? How? What did you do? How did you deal with that stuff? Yeah, never in a good way. It was never healthy, was it? So just to let you know that Lydia was a person of pain. It says she was a seller of purple. That's an expensive dye back in those days. A lot of times you could associate maybe like royalty or wealthy people would like own this type of thing. Materials dyed in this expensive dye. Um, and so because of who she'd sell to, her business, uh, it's not that just anybody could get involved in selling purple, the color of royalty. But Lydia was in it. And some people have even speculated that maybe this was her and her husband's business. And when he passed away, she was like, I can carry this on. And so, but she was a businesswoman and obviously doing pretty good. It says she was the, of the city of Thyatira, it says in verse 14. Thyatira. You only find this like several times in the scriptures. You find it here, then you find it in Revelation. It's one of the seven churches of church history. You know what the word Thyatira means? Thyatira means odor of affliction. Odor of affliction. Thyatira is actually not just a church or a city that had a church in it. It's also a period of time in church history called the period of Thyatira. And it's called odor of affliction because this is when the dark ages took place. The church was trying to shine the light and the world was, was, was cramming it, man. It was a dark, dark time. It was a time when... Um, the Catholic Church was really aggressive towards new Christianity. Kind of like you would see the Jews in the Bible going after new Christians at the beginning there. They crucified Jesus right now. Same type of thing was happening. They were crushing Christians, man. I'm talking about crushing them. That whole period of church history is dark and dreary. And it's filled with blood. This is where Lydia, a person of pain comes from a place of pain. There's no synagogue in this town. So she's down at the river getting what she can. It said she was a worshiper of God in verse 14. But I just want you to know the place she was from was a place of trouble. A place that definitely was not friendly to believers, even though at this time she wasn't even a believer. So I guess I just wanted to let you know this Lydia, she is a not just a person of pain. She comes from a place where pain existed. It had the odor of affliction. And yet it says she worshiped God in verse 14. She worshiped God and then it says, and she heard us. Hey, mark that down right there. That don't seem like anything big. But these ladies are sitting out and Paul comes along and just explains who he is, tells a story that says, and she heard us. Lydia heard us. Yet yeah, she paid attention. I want to hear what you have to say. In Romans 10 14, you know what it says? People will never get saved if there's never a preacher. It says, how can they hear without a preacher? I believe Lydia, with her pain in her life, the place of pain she comes from, sitting with a group of women and just trying to figure life out, trying to get it together. And God sent her a preacher. Reminds me of my mother in the projects. 
except on the social scale, would be the opposite. But the, the same needs to happen. So God loved her so much. And it's, Paul said she heard us. And you know what Paul did? If you look at what Paul's message always was, he, went, he preached the gospel. He preached the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's what he preached. Jesus Christ is resurrected. The only way to deal with your sin, deal with your pain, deal with your past. Jesus Christ took it, buried, resurrected three days later. You need to know him. You need to meet Jesus. It says she heard us, and then the next part is probably the best part of the whole story. Whose heart the Lord opened. Wow. She heard truth, and the Lord opened her heart. And she became very vulnerable. And I would say Lydia probably was not a very vulnerable lady. I don't know exactly their prayer time down at the river, how that all looked and what it was like. But man, she... I guess I would think of Lydia. Has anybody ever read Proverbs 31? There's a Proverbs 31 woman. You ever read through that list of stuff? It's just kind of shocking. You're like, it's like a fairy tale. Is there any woman that could ever like accomplish all these things? There was one. You know, we, we find her there. You read about her. And Lydia, man, is kind of this, man, this lady gets a lot done. You know, something too, a lot of times, uh, Christians are crazy. Because Christians, depending on sometimes what culture does, they make these things up. And because, now like, the Bible says that a woman should love her husband, you should love your children, and you should guide your house. So women read that and just say, women should not work outside the home. Well, I don't know where you made that up at. Um, that's not true. It just says your home should be the priority. Right? And then all of a sudden you run into somebody like Lydia. And of course, now she didn't know Christ up to this point. But here she, she's a, a business lady. And let me tell you how I know she's done something right. She heard the word, but the Lord opened her heart. Guys, this is what it told. I think she had some sort of religion going on in her life. But she had no relationship with the Lord. And this is what she was hearing. And let me tell you what, religion's like here. You got to figure it out. You got to logically put all the pieces together. You know how it is. We all, a little bit of science, a little bit of this, and you add it all together. You're like, man, so I think maybe, well, that Buddhist concept does make sense. You know, you just put all the pieces together. You kind of become, uh, if you want to call it a good, like, religious person. But now all of a sudden, her religion went from here, and God opened up here, where the emptiness was, where the pain sits. You can understand all you want to, the pain. But it hurts here. Oh, I got it figured out. I know. Logically, I got answers. I know exactly what it is. But every once in a while, it still makes me cry. Yeah, because the pain is in the seat of your emotions, of your soul. And God says, that's where I need to get to. And God cracks her open. And, you know, and the Bible uses phrases in Corinthians like Satan blinds the minds of those that believe not. So there's like a deception, a blinding. And so the gospel needs preached, but God needs to open up hearts, right? We can't open up hearts. That's God's business. But it's our business is to deliver the message, right? I was the paper boy. That's what I did. My job, throw it on their porch. And some people would buy them stupid hooks that go into their mailbox. And they made me run up on the porches and put them in that hooks. I hated that. I liked the families and just, yeah, toss them on the porch. We'll get it. They were the best people because you could make money on those houses. <laughs> Throw them papers. I couldn't make those people read. I uh, called the newspaper one time. I said, there's like 35 papers on this dude's porch. And they're like, he's paying his bills. Throw the paper on the porch. Done. I can't make him read it, but I can throw it up there. And I did. I kept throwing it day after day. The Lord opened her heart. And I think at this point, she enters into a relationship, a heartfelt relationship with the Lord. She heard us. The Lord opened her heart. And then here's how I know the next phrase says, she attended to the things spoken by Paul. Do you see that word attended to? Attended to. She took action towards that ship came to shore. That's exactly what that phrase means. She gave attention to the things spoken of God's word. So, yeah, the Lord opened her heart. What is she going to do now? Because the Bible, if you look at the story like the seed and the sower, different things happen. The enemy comes through and tries to get that seed, like all kinds of crazy. The Lord opened her heart and she said, all right. She attended to, John 1, 12 says, but as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. God will crack a guy or a girl's heart wide open. 
but you have a responsibility to attend to these things, to bring that ship to shore, to say, okay, I will welcome that. This is exactly what Lydia did. Smart lady, business lady, probably most likely a widow, sitting with a group of women, having their whatever they're doing, their prayer time, their discussion. Like she was a worshiper of God, but she was still clueless. Paul comes and throws them other puzzle pieces down that match the exact thing right where they were at. God sent her a preacher, and the Bible said she heard. Um, God opened her heart, and then she says, I'll take that. And so she attended to those things. That ship landed, right? Has everybody got that? Like to obey is better than sacrifice. You know, religion can bring sacrifice, but you know, just obey. This is what God's word says. And she's like, I need a savior. It's exactly what she did. Um, she did the Romans 10, 9 and 10. I believe in my heart, but now I will confess it with my mouth. She attended to the things that were preached and spoken. James 2 says you can have faith, but faith without works is, it's dead, right? It means she acted upon it. She seen it and she says, I'm gonna attend to that. And so, bam, the connection took place. And people want to argue this all day long, you know, because what is salvation exactly? When does it take place? You know, is it got to be when God illuminates, opens a man's understanding? What about the preacher? What's his job? And the answer to all that is yes, 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 yes. It all has to take place. Yes. Heard us, the Lord opened her heart. She attended to the things that were spoken. Check this out in verse 15. And when she was baptized, this is awesome, because what you see is, she received Christ, the message that Paul was preaching, and read like chapter 17. You'll see the message that Paul preached. It was the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. She received it, and then she acted upon it. That's what baptism, baptism is not salvation. Baptism is, I'm going public with what happened on the inside. The Lord cracked over her heart, and now she was going public. And she said, okay, he cracked open my heart. I've cracked open the community. I'll let everybody know I'm a believer. And so she was baptized. But then notice what it says next. It says, and when she was baptized and her household. That's a big part I wanted to bring up. And I think it's a big spot, man, here on Mother's Day to preach. Notice, moms, sometimes you want to change your children. The change needs to happen in you first. And then all of a sudden you become a modeler. You're modeling the things of the Bible and your kids are seeing that. You know, a lot of people, you know, it's like my dad. My dad smokes two packs. I still smoke two packs of cigarettes a day. He always tells us, you guys don't be smoking. You know, well, what did we do our whole lives? We just wanted to smoke. You know, that's just what he did. That's what we grew around and just looking. And actually, when times get nervous, it just, it, it just, it looks appealing, man. It's just like, wow, I would love it. Uh, it just feels right, you know. It's because this is what he modeled for me. And so now she gets baptized, changing her first, but it says her household. Um, it never mentions her husband. It just mentions a household that she is responsible for. Notice she gets baptized. They follow suit. You know why? Mama, she was an influencer. She influenced her family. She influenced her kids. It's our greatest job. Moms, it's the best thing you could ever do. Because, you know, we reached a spot where my mom couldn't spank us anymore. She couldn't whip our tail anymore. She couldn't beat us up anymore. And at that point, she was banking on influence. Would we listen to what's right? Would we follow suit? And I'm here to tell you, it worked. It worked. I followed suit. I'm pretty confident that I serve and love the Lord today because I've seen it modeled with my mom. Even though she didn't hit me with the hamburger spatula right in my face. I do remember that. But you know what I remember more than that? She loved the Lord. I remember her grabbing me and asking me to forgive her. That's what she would do. My mom was famous for that. She'd roll you over in the living room, smash the lamp on you, and then later pick you up and cry and say, my gosh, your mom's awful. I love you so much. You know, we're like, my mom loves me, man. You know, that's like, I don't know. Me and my brother, I always felt like we were like dogs. You ever do that to your dog? Like whip your dog for something ridiculous? <laughs> you whip him, you get on, you lock him up, put him somewhere, throw him outside. Like 10 minutes later, he like forgets everything. He's just like, hey, I'm glad you're here. But dude, I just beat the tar out of you. I just put you into the seizures and you want me to hold you. How does that work? Well, that's how we work. We remembered that good because she was at mom. How are your kids following you? I mean, think of these things. She was baptized. Like, I'm going to step in front of everybody. And I, I, 
And also it influenced that her whole household said, we're going to do it. My, she had that much influence on it. She was a business lady. She was smart. She was involved in commerce. She had a group of women she was hanging with. They seemed to be good women, like, you know, more old women wanting to sit around and pray together. Her name means pain. She didn't come from a great place. It means odor of affliction. And through all of that trauma and craziness, God lined her whole life up. Probably a husband that passed away, awful, and led her whole life to a spot where here she is. And God says, I got to meet her. And he sent a preacher. And she'd seen it, heard it, and God opened up her heart and she attended to those things. And then she became a follower of Christ. She was willing to get baptized and claim to be a Christian. <clears throat> hey, let me throw some out. Speaking of women being an influence on your kids. You guys, the greatest deceiver in the Bible's name is Jacob, right? His name means deceiver. You ever really read his story? When you read his story sometimes, I'm like, man, he is a deceptive, slimy guy. But then all of a sudden you get to the book of Genesis and you're reading through the story. And all of a sudden... <clears throat> You know, dad's getting ready to die and calls, you know, hey, Esau, man, I, I'd really like some of that, some venison, man. If you could, he's the hunter, right? And so mama is listening on. And mama sees what's taking place. And as soon as Esau goes out for the kill, mama comes into Jacob and says, mama's got a plan. Your dad wants some venison. We're going to take some hair and glue it on your hands because your brother's more hairy than you are. We're going to put some, when they rub, you know, got some clothes that smelled like the outdoors, just like your brother would. And what we're going to do is we are going to deceive your dad. So, yeah, Jacob's a deceiver. He's a slime ball. But you look at him when he's just a young man. I'm just like, boy, that's a learned trait, isn't it? Deception from a mom became deception in a child. I don't know about you, but. You know, we, when, our, when our children ever did anything bad, me and Becky looked at each other. We always looked at each other and be like, because I was thinking, that's you. And she's thinking, no, that's you. And the truth be known, it was us. You know, the bad, that you, that's when you see it. It comes out. And, you know, it's like, a, you ever say some cuss words around your house? And you, you're and mad. And you're like, oh, I shouldn't do that. You can even apologize to your family. And then the heat of battle, you watch it come out and one of your own. That's not good, is it? You don't remember that watching a little house in a prairie? They moved into the city. Girl dropped her potato at the table. Do you remember that? And she cursed. I remember she cursed. I was like, because I was just a little kid. Like, and she's heard that somewhere. That's been modeled for her. So here, you know what she did? She modeled for her house. What an influence she had on her kids. Hey, moms, if, if you do not want to be an influence, and you're, you're going to be whether you like it or not. The weather, you're going to be a good one or not. Proverbs says when things go down, when the crap hits the fan, it'll break your heart. It'll be you that'll be very sensitive to this, knowing this child came from your womb. And then the way you did the modeling and the molding and you did the, uh, you did the work and it didn't turn out so good. It's, it's very, very hard on you. So just want to encourage you. You are an influence on your kids. Influence them like Lydia did. Notice what she said next. She baptized her household and then she besought us saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. She constrained these guys, these godly men to say, and by the way, this is another way you can tell she was wealthy. She had rooms. She had spots for them. I think she had a big enough place. She's like, hey, come stay with us, man. We'll take care of you. We'll get you fed. I mean, because she was a business lady. She was able to do that. So, and she constrained them. I just want you to notice this. That once she met Jesus Christ, once this great thing happened inside of her heart and in her life, now all of a sudden, her house, her house becomes a place. It's the center of ministry. Now she wants to turn her house and like, this is what we want to do. We want more people to get this message so the missionaries can stay here. I'll keep you fed. I'll take care of you. Now, this is not said yet, but Paul ends up going to prison in this chapter. They end up getting up in the streets. They go to prison and then there's a great, you know, kind of a, a God gets them out. It's kind of a miraculous story. <clears throat> you don't hear of Lydia again until verse 40. If you go down to verse 40, it says, they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia. When you get out of jail, they knew where to go, you know, <laughs> Lydia. And it's very possible when you see Paul and them, they get ready to exit Lydia's area. Most likely what happened was Lydia funded the mission of God going forward. Most likely that's what she did. 
So notice, moms, just want to, today, in closing, it starts here. It starts with you. I know you might want your son or your daughters. There's change in them. Hey, change is hard enough for you. Get that right, because they're watching. They're watching. And then you can influence them. Then, then, then they'll follow suit. They'll see the change is real, and it really happens. Even my brother knew where to go. He knew where to go. Why? Because it was modeled for him by our mother. And then you can see her life was so changed. And you know what it changes first? It don't say anything about it. Boy, it changed the way she did business. She went back to Thyatira and started another shop. And she, it don't say any of that type of, you know what it says? It affected her house. Not only her kids, but then she had godly people coming in. Her house became a place of uh, refuge, maybe. It became like <coughs> control center for the mission going forward. And then when they get out of prison, they knew where to go. They'd been beat up and bruised. And she's like, and what a place to come to. Because Lydia goes, I know what pain's like. I come from a place called the odor of affliction. Dude, the place I grew up, I know what pain's like. Come in here, guys. We need to get you fixed up. And I think they came in and they took... <coughs> They got nice meals and a nice shower, and then they went on to do it. And I think that lady, out of her own account, I think she spent the money to see the mission of God go forward. What a beautiful story. So I wanted to share with you the story of Lydia. I've never really, I taught the book of Acts before, but didn't put a lot of emphasis on Lydia. So Lydia is one of those ladies in the Bible that's a great model for you and me, and uh, especially for you ladies to look. So what did you get out of today? That's the question. What are you gleaning from this message? How are you going to be different as a mom? Really, look at your children. Do you see the change that needs to take place in them? I think like Lydia, gather with the right group of people. I mean, she had a tribe before she was even going to church. It was a good group of people. Hang around the right people, mom. Get around godly people. And some of you don't, you know why you don't do it? Because you're embarrassed. You look at their kids and you think in your mind that that lady's perfect. I got news for you. She's not. I'm married to her. She's not. You need a group of people, and yes, you pray together, you worship God, and all of a sudden what's going to happen, you're going to hear God's word, hearts will be open, you'll be vulnerable, and the change will take place. You'll attend to the things spoken out of by the Bible, and your kids will follow suit. That's the best. That's the best.